Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin by welcoming the 329 people that we have online at the moment watching the webinar, and also to the viewers who will watch it later on as a podcast. MHPM would like to acknowledge the sovereignty of the traditional owners of the lands across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay respect to the elders, past, present and future, and the memories, the traditions and the culture and hopes of Indigenous Australians. Hi, I'm Damien Rick, and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. I'm an Associate Professor in Social Work at Flinders University, a Fellow of the Australian Psychological Society, and I'm a psychotherapist working in private. I'd like to now introduce you all to the panel who will be speaking this evening. Uh, our first presenter will be Associate Professor Michelle Telfer, a Victorian-based paediatrician. Michelle is the Head of the Department of Adolescent Medicine at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. In addition to improving medical and mental health services for the transgender population, Michelle is currently advocating for legal change to allow transgender young people to access hormone treatment without the need for approval by the Family Court of Australia. Michelle, how far away do you think legislative change is? Well, Damien, unfortunately things have stagnated recently, but we're working on a number of options both through the courts and with legislative change. Thanks, Michelle. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, the next person on our panel is Dr. Elizabeth Ann Riley, a Sydney Bath counsellor, academic and clinical supervisor who specialises in gender diversity. Elizabeth provides support and counselling for children and adolescents with differences in gender identity and expression and their parents transgender youth, couples where a partner is transitioning and those seeking support for gender related surgery. Elizabeth also delivers professional development in gender diversity for schools, clinicians and other service providers. Elizabeth, what are some of the common concerns you come across when training at school? I think probably the big question is about bathrooms and when children go on camps or when they're doing sport activities. They're, they're the big things that come up I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah, I think definitely I uh, think bathrooms are very much on the radar for everyone internationally in regards to concerns people have and issues that get raised. Um, ne thanks, that, Elizabeth. Next I'd like to introduce Associate Professor Campbell Paul, right. who's a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist at Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. Over the last 15 years, Campbell has worked with many children and young people experiencing gender dysphoria and their families, and he was involved in the establishment of the original Royal Children's Hospital Gender Service. <coughs> Campbell, how much has the RCH Gender Service grown since its inception? Um, it's grown quite a bit. Um, originally, uh, uh, about 15 years ago, there was uh, Professor Gary Warren, endocrinologist, and myself. Um, but with uh, um, exponential rise in the number of uh, referrals, we've had uh, around 200 referrals uh, this year, um, similar number last year. Um, uh, and through the lobbying of uh, Michelle Telfer particularly, we've got funding from our state government for more staff. So we've got three other paediatricians, we'll be together four part-time uh, child psychiatrists, part-time paediatricians as well, two child psychologists part-time, uh, Donna Ede, who's the clinical nurse uh, consultant organising us all, paediatric endocrinologist, gynaecologist, um, speech pathologist, uh, admin person Chantel, and uh, we've got access to the children's ethics service at the children's, our legal service, uh, andrology, urology at the children's, and uh, a, an evaluation coordinator. So you can see it's uh, expanded quite a bit. But the demand is still there and we still have a, a significant waiting time for new referrals. Well, it's certainly wonderful when the Victorian Government announced the funding for the service. So it's amazing that it's being recognised and hopefully that yeah. has other states to come. Last but certainly not least, I'd like to welcome Associate Professor Darren Russell. Darren is a sexual health physician and the Director of Sexual Health at Cairns Hospital. He holds the positions of Clinical Associate Professor in the Department of Population Health at the University of Melbourne, and Adjunct Associate Professor in the School of Medicine and Dentistry at James Cook University. He is the Chair of the HIV Foundation Queensland and a past President of the Australasian Chapter of Sexual Health Medicine of the Royal Australian College of Physicians, the Victorian AIDS Council 
and the Australian Federation of AIDS Organisations. He has an interest in transgender health, indigenous health, and the elimination of HIV and hepatitis infections. Darren, what was it that made you shift from GP work to sexual health work? Yes, I used to work predominantly in general practice in Melbourne, but I found that more and more of my work was uh, associated with sexual health. And I started to enjoy it more and then specialised in it. And uh, when I moved up to Cairns, the job was just in sexual health. And that lets me uh, do a lot of work with transgender individuals, which is something I really enjoy doing. Hmm. Thank you, Darren. Um, so the next thing to cover is uh, to talk about some of the ground rules that we have established and also to remind you that if you find the general chat box too distracting, which it sometimes can be because always people are writing a lot down below, you're free to welcome uh, to, to write things down there as well, or questions or comments, you can minimise that by clicking the small down arrow at the top of the chat box. Uh, but you know, if you feel comfortable listening to us, watching us, and also typing things in the chat box, in the general chat, please do. Uh, so some ground rules just to cover before we start. We want to really make sure that everyone gets the most that they can out of the webinar, the live webinar. Um, so we need just to remember when we're commenting uh, in the chat box to be respectful of other people and other panellists. We don't know who's in the room. We don't know where they come from or what their personal experiences are. So we want to really be sure that we're being inclusive uh, if you have any technical issues, if you can't hear, if your uh, visual is cut out, then you can comment in the technical help and someone from the team will get back to you. Um, please remember that this is a professional development activity. So we want the comments, if you're typing comments in the general chat, to be on the topic of the professional development other than more general uh, discussion. Um, and importantly, and I'll mention this again at the end, we really value uh, your feedback, so we're going to improve these webinars or, or change anything that you think could be changed. Uh, so at the end of the, web the webinar, there'll be a short exit survey, so we'd really like you to take a moment to complete that uh, before you log out for the evening. So just to recap the learning outcomes that you would have already been sent. So we're going to be exploring a, a case study that you've already received and that I'll do a recap of in a little minute. Um, and that is going to help us work uh, together as a team to explore some of the general principles of providing a safe and supportive environment for young people seeking care for gender dysphoria, implement some of the key principles, how you might do that in providing an integrated approach in your services, and also identify some of the challenges and tips and strategies for how we provide a collaborative response to young people and to their families as well especially with regards to uh, risks of depression, anxiety, self-harm or suicide with regards to gender dysphoria. So next on the slide, uh, we're going to shift to Michelle. So we're doing things a little bit differently if you've attended webinars in the past before. Uh, we often run through all the presentations in a row focusing on the case study. This evening, Michelle is going to uh, start us off by giving a bit of an overview of the population group we're talking about and some, some sort of common general themes that we really want everyone to be aware of. And then I'll recap the case in case you've forgotten it, and then we'll move on to Elizabeth and Campbell and Down to give their specific interpretations of the case itself. So thank you, Michelle. Take it away. Thanks, Damien. My slides have just slipped through. I've missed one. There we are. So, I'm um, just as a quick introduction to gender dysphoria. I wanted to mention that it was first included in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual uh, Version 3 in 1980. So, a relatively new diagnosis as such, but was renamed gender dysphoria in uh, 2013. And what gender dysphoria refers to is the distress that may accompany the incongruence between one's experienced or expressed gender and one's assigned gender from birth. And what's really important is that not all individuals who or will experience the distress as, as a result of the incongruence, but many are distressed if the desired physical interventions such as hormones or surgical interventions are not available. And the numbers are quite large in terms of uh, incidents. 
the best study we have comes from New Zealand where they surveyed over 8,000 secondary school students. And 1.2% of that population, all adolescents, reported being transgender, with 2.5% reporting not being sure about their gender. And these uh, numbers are reflected in increasing referrals that we're seeing at the Royal Children's Hospital here. And um, I have a graph there which shows the increasing numbers from one in 2003 when the service was started by Campbell Paul, as he mentioned earlier, to this year where we'll receive well over 200 referrals. We feel that the increasing number of referrals comes with social change and increasing acceptance of transgender identities in the general community. And what we've seen is celebrity culture reflecting these social changes with um, a number of uh, famous families, I guess you could say, um, coming out with um, their disclosures of their gender identity. Um, John Jolly Pitt is the, the son of Angelina Jolly and Brad Pitt, who was assigned uh, as female and named Shiloh at birth. And there's Chaz Bono, who was uh, the son of, um, who is the son of Cher and Sonny Bono. And of course, the events of the Kardashians, um, which brought a lot of publicity to uh, trans identities. And in Australia, we have a similar context um, with increasing acceptance um, of trans children and adolescents um, with programs such as the Four Corners. Um, program that was aired in 2014 which reached an audience of over 1.2 million people in a recent Australian Story episode um, featuring Georgie Stone, a transgender adolescent, um, also reaching over a million viewers and both very positive gender affirming stories for trans youth. Sometimes we find acceptance in the places we least expect it. This is a birth announcement from a rural town in Queensland. Um, and I'll quickly read it out. Uh, the notice says, a retraction bogus. In 1995, we announced the arrival of our sprogget, Elizabeth Ann, as a daughter. He informs us that we were mistaken. Oops, how bad. We would now like to present our wonderful son, Kai Bogus. Loving you is the easiest thing in the world to party your room. So why is it important that we affirm trans identities and provide not only support, but um, if required, medical intervention? There are numerous studies, both done overseas and within Australia, that show that adolescents who cannot access treatment have a 50% rate of self-harm and 28% of adolescents attempt suicide. And this number um, increases only across one's lifetime from 28% attempting suicide in adolescents to 50% throughout adulthood. Frightening statistics. Our treatment is based on international published guidelines, uh, which will be available for you. And just to quickly run through the general process of um, treatment through um, a multidisciplinary team, such as the one that we have in Melbourne, but in similar tertiary centres across Australia, You'll find that all children will undergo a multidisciplinary assessment, a psychiatrist or psychologist, um, usually a combination of both, pediatrician, fertility expert, um, nursing and other support. The first stage of treatment uh, is with regards to puberty blocking, um, which, uh, uh, a hormone treatment that is reversible. Um, and this tends to be started at kind of stage two when children are around the age of 10 to 12 years. The second stage of treatment um, is with hormones such as estrogen or testosterone, depending on your gender identity. And this stage of treatment has some irreversible uh, effects and in Australia requires um, approval by the family court. In Australia, it's not legal to have surgery under the age of 18, and we refer anyone who wants surgery in um, uh, adult services um, to access that. And my last slide, just really um, uh, wanting to reassure that the published data that we have shows that treatment in a supportive environment, which includes 
TV blockers and hormone treatment has been shown to improve mental health outcomes, improve quality of life to the extent, and this uh, study was done in, um, in the Netherlands, the outcomes for this group of 55 trans adolescents once they're in early adulthood was that their quality of life was the same as the general population. They had higher education completion than the general population and also their vocational outcomes were also very good. So reassuring data that the treatment we're following is helping um, the lives of trans children and adolescents. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michelle. I'm really glad that you covered uh, all of it, of course, but especially around media representations, because I know I often get a lot asked a lot when I speak to the media or get asked by other people, why are we seeing so many more people coming forward? I think it is that people hear other people's stories and they realise it mirrors their own story and they have a way to speak about their experiences. Yes, I think young people are feeling increasingly safe to come forward and express themselves in this way. Mm. And they're also finding a language to do that. Yeah, thanks a lot, Michelle. Um, so as I said, now that Michelle's given us a fantastic overview of uh, young people experiencing gender dysphoria and how we work with them, uh, I'm just going to briefly recap the case in case you've forgotten some of the details and then we'll move on to Elizabeth. Uh, so in the case, we have the story of Stevie, a young person who is 10, who was assigned male at birth, who's the youngest child of four. And from a very young age, Stevie has enjoyed playing with her sister's toys, wanting to be called Stevie. Uh, Stevie's parents have been very resistant to that, uh, have refused to call uh, Stevie Stevie, insisting upon calling her Stephen, refusing to use female pronouns. Uh, Stevie experienced bullying at school, has expressed suicidal thoughts and depression. Uh, Stevie was referred to a GP who was reluctant, uh, and Stevie was reluctant to talk to them. So then there was a referral to a psychologist, and when speaking to the psychologist, Stevie opened up about her gender experiences. So we'll now turn to, Mich uh, to Elizabeth, who's going to talk through her perspectives as a counsellor. Thanks a lot, Elizabeth. Thanks, Damien. Um, I I just want to start with what it is I do when people come to me. My aim is really to understand at a gut level how this young person feels about themselves and what's true for them. I let them know very clearly that I have no agenda about who they are or how they express themselves. So I want to see their, their perspective and understand where they're coming from. I want to evaluate the consistency of how they're feeling about themselves over time. I want to assess the amount of support these young people have, both in their family, in their community, with their peers. I want to provide education and networking. And you know what I do depends on the age of the child. If a parent rings me and says, I have a two-year-old, or I have a five-year-old, or I have a seven-year-old, I actually say to them, look, I'd rather you leave the child at home and come and talk to me yourself, and I can support you in raising a gender-variant child because I don't think it's fair to have children with gender diversity have to focus on their gender in a way that other children don't. And I don't want that child to feel that they have a problem or that they're being pathologised. Because no intervention can really be done around their gender until they're approaching puberty. Now, having said that, there may be children with um, dysfunctional family situations, with high anxiety, in which case they need to see somebody about that. But it's not about their gender, it's really about the other pressures that are on them, perhaps. So the process involves having the young person and their parents in the room together and asking everyone what they'd like to get out of this meeting. And then I ask the young person to leave and I talk to the parents. I want to know how they're feeling, what their concerns are, what kind of relationship do they have with, the, with their child. What is it that they know or understand about gender identity and gender diversity and particularly with their child? I want to know what resources and networks they might have be able to tap into and I can provide them some, some of that information. Um, I want to understand their fears. You know, what is it that they're really concerned about with their child having these gender differences? 
I want to know if they are having concerns about disclosure to the family, whether they're concerned about acceptance. I want to know what kind of information that they have and that they need. And you know, are there time frames that they're concerned about? So it's really giving them an opportunity, um, an opportunity to have their anger, their feelings and their concerns and be really validated around that because that opens people up to being able to hear what's really going on for their child. So it's important that they understand that gender identity is how we think about ourselves. It's how we identify with our whole body. Whereas sexual orientation is something very different. It's about who we're attracted to sexually. And that our biological sex is then about our anatomy. And the gender roles are imposed externally. So it's important that they understand these separate parts of our, ourselves and our identity with sex and gender so that they don't get confused about what it is we're talking about. So from my perspective, I'm looking at a lot of areas to explore in the assessment with the young person. I want to know if they've had any support prior. I want to understand from their perspective what their family relationships are. Who is their main support? Who's the person that they could disclose to and feel comfortable about it? I want to understand if there's any cultural or religious influences that may affect how they feel about themselves and what they want to do. It feels important to know whether they've got issues with their weight or their eating or sleeping. You know, do they have any vivid or repetitive dreams? Because sometimes in dreams, children dream of themselves in their identified gender, not in their anatomical gender. So it, it gives me a bit of information about levels of gender dysphoria. I want to know and understand what things that they're interested in, what they do with their time. Have they been depressed? Have they self-harmed? Do they have a history of mental health issues? Are they on any kind of medication? Is there any history of substance abuse, risk behaviour? Have they experienced any bullying or abuse? Um, how is school going? How do they integrate there? How social are they? What is their awareness around their body? And I, that question comes through when I ask young people what happens to them when they look in the mirror. And it gives me a lot of information about levels of gender dysphoria, about their body, about concerns they have about what they see. I want to know how puberty has been for them, if they're post-pubertal, um, what happened, were they expecting it and, and what was their reaction to that. I want to know if they understand their sexuality yet, do they have a desire to have children. You know, what are their beliefs and awarenesses regarding gender expression and diversity? Is it that they just want to behave differently but not actually change their body? So getting really clear about what the nuts and bolts are as gender for them. And um, as I mentioned, assessing a level of gender dysphoria, um, their knowledge of trans issues and trans people, have they ever met people or spoken online with them? You know, do they have a particular pronoun or name preference that they have and who, who knows about this and when have they told them? And then of course, what level of support they have. So then I share the relevant information with their parents, with the adolescent's consent. I go through what I've written down and I say, this might be really useful for your parents to know. I also say to them, is there one thing you want your parents to know or is there one thing you want to tell your parents? And then I'll discuss you know, the urgent issues, what their immediate needs are and what the next steps are. So with particular specific to this family, I think there needs to be an awareness of the older siblings and how the situation will affect them. I want to know what myths and stereotypes the family are holding and help um, dispel that. I want to understand the family's attitudes. I want to explain the differences between non-conforming gender behaviour and gender dysphoria. And I want to know what their experience has been of their child. I'm going to listen to their overwhelm, their fears, their anger, their concerns for the future. And the, regarding that statement, God made them a boy and that can't be changed, I want them to understand that gender dysphoria is a natural phenomenon that has occurred across time, across countries. Um, that it doesn't distinguish between different um, categories of people at all. That I actually do a lot of gender diversity training in Catholic schools, so if they're Catholic that could be useful. 
um, and that there are severe mental health consequences if the parent don't support the child. And Michelle mentioned the um, rate of suicide if the children don't have access to professional support. Well, the rate of suicide jumps dramatically if the children don't have their parents' support. So I need the parents to understand that. And there's a document called Families in Transition, which is incredibly useful um, that I like to send to parents. So that's me finished. Thanks, Damien. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. And I know that people in the chat are really enjoying uh, what's been presented, and particularly are interested around the issues of religious diversity and how do we respect parents' religiosity, but also support young children. So hopefully we'll be able to come back to that a bit later in the question time. Uh, I'd like to also just remind all of our uh, viewers today that if you're interested in any of the resources that we've put together for you, they're available in the resource folder, which is down the bottom right-hand side of your screen. There's a little uh, folder symbol next to a little tool symbol. And so click on the folder symbol and you'll be able to access those resources. So now we'll move on to Campbell Paul and his presentation from a psychiatrist's perspective. Thanks a lot, Damien, and, and thanks uh, Michelle and Elizabeth too for um, uh, starting us off on this uh, journey. I thought I'd focus um, my comments around uh, clinical, the case material provided around Stevie and, and her family. Um, and just to reiterate the key things I, that have come out of that for me, that here's a young person who's got a demonstrated persistent interest in stereotypic girls' toys and clothing, um, she's got strong identity statements that she is a girl, refers her feminine name in a context where she's able to express these eventually to the psychologist. And thinking of it from the perspective of the role of the family doctor, the community psychologist, and then the specialist gender service clinician. I think underlying all this, the overall objective is to support Stevie's optimal emotional, social, cognitive, physical development. And we have to do that through helping him, uh, sorry, her, explore her own experience of self and support the parents to support Stevie, two streams. Clearly Stevie's become depressed, anxious, distressed, and feels that they may be unable to share this um, distress, the source of the distress with her family. And I think it's important for each of us, uh, each of the professionals involved, to help her feel safe and understood and not alone in this. Um, and to help her parents understand and help her explore safely and creatively who she is. With, as um, uh, Michelle and uh, Elizabeth have just mentioned, there's clear evidence that uh, parent support is crucial for a child's healthy emotional social development um, in the context of gender dysphoria. Without it, there's this real risk of increasing severe depression and self-harm, and the case vignette clearly describes that. So again, two tasks. Help the child work through things, both the internal conflict that they're needing to sort out and the relationship that they have with their family and peers. One. Secondly, to help the parents in brief, um, uh, well, there's a, a reference to the cover of a copy of the uh, Australian Weekend magazine where a journalist uh, was writing about her distress and concern about her uh, strongly uh, female identifying boy and she's trying to work out what's going to happen, what's going to be the evolution of her, uh, his identity. At that stage, he was identifying as a boy with a strong interest in girls' things. Um, and I guess that emphasises one of the critical things, that we don't precisely know uh, how any particular child is going to go in their own um, development. Oops, sorry. Back here. Um, we do know that um, but for, for very young children, um, certainly by the end of the third year of life and generally before, um, kids are able to differentiate between male and female um, and to be able to identify the sex uh, of their own gendered body. Um, so our job as therapists, as the GP too, I think, and the psychologist, is to affirm um, and to support the child in their exploration of who they are. A child who might have a, an ongoing transgender identity is one where there's 
evidence of insistence about their uh, gender, consistence about it, persistence in their uh, gender uh, expression, and strong identity statements. I am a girl or I am a boy. Uh, I guess if you think of it, for most of us, that's how we experience our identity, our gender identity. Um, and uh, for the kids we see um, who are strongly transgender, this is how we can uh, get a picture of who's going to be um, uh, persistently um, uh, in the uh, transgender. These are good indicators. Early onset of um, expression of, uh, uh, of a transgender identity is also uh, crucial. But we see lots of children, um, young adolescents, um, who present uh, for the first time um, in uh, post-pubertal period and uh, certainly in adult too, adulthood too. Uh, with the first overt statements about uh, their gender diverse existence. So there are kids where there is a strong likelihood of this uh, uh, transgender identity persisting. And there's other kids where there's gender diversity or a gender expansive um, expression of themselves. Um, and uh, we don't know um, with the kids who are gender diverse, gender expansive, how things are going to evolve. Um, so in the meantime, it's really important for us to give them an opportunity to talk, explore, play, share with their parents what their experience is. I guess the other important thing is to make it clear that although um, there's maybe a, a, a tacit and an express um, view that the world is um, set up in a binary situation with these male and female, um, with the kids we see, I think it's important to let them know that there are options, there are uh, other positions. Um, the world is not as binary as uh, one might think. Um, so how does the child uh, work their pathway? One of the difficult things is I think many um, children, young adolescents, uh, may feel the need to keep their experience of their gender uh, secret and I uh, feel unsafe to share it with people, as was the case with Stevie. Um, and uh, our job is to work with the young person, with the parent, to provide a safe, secure, trusting environment where they can uh, explore this. This will require often some subtlety um, so that if the young person reveals to the psychologist or the GP their private feelings about who they are, uh, we should explore that with them before um, uh, telling their parents. Um, Stevie was making that clear. I don't want my parents to know. It's hard for kids to predict what their parents are going to say. Generally, parents are trying to do the best by their child. Um, even in this context, uh, um, parents are frightened, confused, distressed when there's a suggestion that their child uh, might not know who they're uh, going to become. Um, it's a delicate process to support the child, support the parent. Excuse interruption. It seems like we have lost Campbell's audio. Sorry about that. Perhaps we might need to move on to Darren and come back to Campbell when his audio is back in play again. Um, I'm very sorry to everyone for that happening. Uh, sometimes these things do happen. If you've attended webinars before, sometimes technology gets the better of us. But thank you uh, to Campbell for everything he was able to relay to us, which was in incredibly interesting and a really useful addition to what uh, Michelle and Elizabeth have already said. Uh, so we'll, we'll move on now to uh, Darren's presentation and perhaps come back to Campbell if we can, uh, if we have time and it sounds working at the end. So Darren, please take it away. Hi, thanks for that Damien and um, hello everyone. Um, as I said uh, at the beginning, as Damien introduced me, I'm a sexual health physician in Cairns. So I'm someone here who's from a, a regional area, not quite remote but uh, certainly rural. And in my part of the world and in many other parts of Australia, general practitioners are often the first port of call in this situation, possibly as they are in the city too, but 
we have fewer uh, other options in regional Australia. And some sexual health clinics may also uh, be contacted, particularly in Queensland where in rural areas um, some sexual health clinics do work with transgender individuals. But a whole range of other people can be involved as well, um, school-based nurses, psychologists, child and youth mental health services uh, may all contact a primary care provider um, wanting some advice about the family or some help. And it's often difficult because uh, many clinics will have very little experience in a regional area. Um, so uh, it can be problematic. We don't have all the bells and whistles of, of the big cities. Um, so help for trans kids and teenagers can be very patchy outside the big cities. And even within the big cities, there can be real problems accessing um, specialist care. And outside Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, we're really struggling to find dedicated centres for transgender health. There is one for uh, in Brisbane as well for children. But um, there are clinicians around the country who do do this work, and there are experts around the country who you can contact as well. But you really may need to ask around. You often find that you're sort of working in the dark when a young transgender person, a kid, comes to see you. If you don't quite know what to do or where to even start with it. So, in Cairns itself, we'd offer counselling through our psychologists. We're fortunate that we have psychologists in our service who are used to working with families and really work with the, the family around their issues and concerns. And I think. Uh, Elizabeth has, has summed those up wonderfully tonight. We would also arrange a referral to a child and youth mental health service and a paediatric endocrinologist. We're fortunate that we have clinicians who are very keen and, and want to be involved. So, so that's fantastic. Um, and as far as medical stuff is concerned, there's really not much to do until puberty starts rearing its ugly head. Uh, and, and then, as Michelle said, we have to do an assessment of the child and and offer blockers if they're appropriate. But that is done as much as possible in a multidisciplinary team. But clearly, the smaller the town, the more difficult it is to do that. And uh, you know, some clinicians don't feel comfortable doing this work, but the families may not be able to travel to bigger cities to get the expert care. And uh, they're really struggling as well. Uh, often, financial issues are involved, and uh, some of the services that are available are private and not public, and there's a cost involved too. So um, I think in Australia, we're, we're lagging behind parts of Europe and the United States, particularly in regional areas where we should be aiming to have more public, uh, publicly funded services to sit alongside private psychologists, GPs, psychiatrists in those areas. Um, but that's about all I'll say um, from, uh, from my perspective of really being in a, in a regional area. I'm happy to talk more about it later. Thanks so much, Darren. And I know that many of our questions that, that came in before the webinar uh, really asked about rural services. So it's good that we've had you there to cover that. And hopefully, we'll come back to that in a little bit when we get to question time. I know we've got Campbell uh, back on the line again now. So hopefully, we might be able to switch back to Campbell. I'm just popping back his slides. Um, and hopefully, Campbell might be able to take us through his last few slides before we move on to question time. Sure. My apologies for that. I'm not sure what happened. I got, uh, got lost, disconnected. Um, so uh, what, what I was saying, I think, was that uh, we've got a delicate process of helping the child feel confident to share in a trusting way with someone who respects them. Who respects them. In this case, the GP and the psychologist, um, the dilemma that they face. I think the dilemma is both an internal one and an external one. Um, as I mentioned, many young children um, uh, feel the need to keep their, their identity a secret before they are eventually able to share it with their parents. Um, and uh, we do know there's no role for conversion therapy for forcing a child to um, change their um, experience of their gender uh, and their, their expression of gender. And if we can help parents um, safely 
encourage the child to feel confident to let them know uh, in the first instance to let their peers know the extended family and then later the school uh, know who they are, how they feel about themselves. That's really important. These um, steps in affirmation include um, um, uh, uh, helping the child um, uh, with their name, uh, clothing, um, appearance, how their hair is cut, gender pronouns, school enrolment, identity documents, all of these things in, uh, step by step parents will help the child. Meanwhile, emphasising that uh, the parents love their uh, child, um, uh, whether they're uh, expressing themselves as a boy or a girl or somewhere in between. And I think it's useful to raise that possibility with the young child. The world does seem binary, but you can be um, your own person. One of the kids we saw uh, had a name for herself, a category for herself. She called herself a male fee, somewhere between male and female before she eventually um, was more confident to call herself a girl. Um, so uh, I've already uh, alluded to these dimensions of, um, of gender. Uh, this is from Peggy Cohen in, uh, in Amsterdam. And it, uh, um, these are important concepts, although they do tend to reflect a binary approach. And I think, again, with kids, we're trying to help them see that the world isn't just black and white, male and female, that there are dimensions of gender and self and expression that can be uh, undertaken there. I've just listed some of the um, uh, um, components of the um, uh, assessment, and I won't deal, detail those. I think they're self-explanatory uh, there. Um, and uh, uh, the process of assessing the young person towards uh, medical treatment, uh, some of those steps are included in the last slide here. Just to conclude, uh, it's important that we provide an opportunity for the child to feel respected and trusted and to be able to safely work out internally and externally in their relationships who they are in a way that their identity is accepted and respected. Um, and uh, that's where I'd like to, to leave my presentation. Thanks very much and sorry for dipping out. Thanks so much Campbell, fantastic. We could have you back on the line again. Uh, so now we've come to the time hopefully we've all been looking forward to which is question time. And we've got about half an hour, a bit under half an hour for questions. And we were very lucky that you all uh, who registered for the webinar sent us through lots and lots of questions and we were very thankful for them. And we were able to go through and identify some key themes that seem to repeat across many of the people registered for the webinar. So we're going to go through some of those now uh, with the time that we have remaining and I'll be directing those to each of our speakers who will take a uh, turn having a bit more to say or uh, to think about what, uh, how they might respond to these questions and certainly we might all chip in uh, in this question time. The first question I have uh, is directed to Elizabeth and it's, uh, someone asks, how do you work with the parents that are not open to their child transitioning in any way, shape or form? And I know that in the general chat lots of people have been asking how do you respond to, to really religious parents who are just not going to accept gender diversity? Mm, thanks Damien. I think look firstly really listen to their perspective and, and have them feel that they're being taken seriously because if we give the people permission to have their own perspective on this then they're more likely to listen to us when we want to give them more information and education. So I aim to engage them through educating them on the facts. You know, I provide evidence of the child's story that indicates a genuine identity or indicators of gender dysphoria. And I want to say clear to them, you know, that I know that, that they want to do what's in their child's best interest and I want to help to support them to do that. It can take time, but the, from the families that I've worked with, which is many now in the hundreds, um, I do know that if there's one parent that's really not supportive, they usually come round, but they have to do it in their own time and they need to be supported through that. It's important that they know that there's nothing they've done, that there's nothing that they've done to cause this, and that as, as um, Campbell mentioned, that 
conversion therapy doesn't work. So I want to help them with strategies. Sometimes it'll be about what, what's my church going to think or what's my family going to think. I mean, we, we in ourselves feel that we'd be able to handle this, but around us it won't. So it's important that they understand what it is and how it's separate and different to other conditions. Um, and the truth is that we all live in a world that oppresses gender diversity. And their child has been dealing with gender policing and pressure their whole life, which we know is also damaging to them. And so I want to inform them of the prevalence, you know, that there's nothing they can do about the gender identity, that the child isn't making a decision about it, that they don't have any choice, and, and really highlight the importance of family support, offer them the resources, and um, let them know that it is a process. And Stay with them, stay working with them, stay having them feel that, you know, I'm an ally for them as well. And I think that's, that's I think that's enough. <laughs> I think that's such an important point because of course our focus is the child, but our focus is also the family and, and children are silenced because of gender norms. But so are family members. And I think often uh, if, as you said, if, if the parents are feeling perhaps incorrectly that their church members might judge them or may not include them or may reject them, they have no way of testing that either. So that they experience that silencing as well. So it's so important, as you said, to speak through those things with people so they can work through what's holding them back. Mm. Uh, our next question is going to go to Michelle. Um, and someone has asked us one of our webinar participants. How, sorry, someone's phone ringing. Um, so, Michelle, um, how do we minimise stigma attached to a gender dysphoria diagnosis? Thanks, Damien. I think there are a number of different ways to answer this question. At an individual and family level, um, young people often come to us knowing that they are gender diverse. Um, especially from uh, an adolescent uh, perspective. Um, and sometimes have thought about this for many, many years, uh, have come to terms with things and felt comfortable enough over time to disclose their identity. Um, and aren't in any way surprised or um, shocked at when, when hearing our conclusions that concur with their thoughts. Um, and really, we're there to um, affirm and support their, their sense of who they are. The parents um, have often not had that same amount of time to come to terms with things and uh, there is often um, a sense of, of shock and worry and concern about the, the, the stigma and how this will be viewed by extended family and schools and uh, community uh, more generally. Um, and I think when when talking about the diagnosis um, and we we help to normalise gender diversity, to put them in touch with other families um, and provide um, support um, at that level, both professionally and through the peer group, to help them deal with some of their fears around uh, perceptions of others. In reality, I think uh, many uh, children experience more acceptance than they're expecting, certainly with extended family members. Um, that is often the case as well, that the fear of disclosure and the stigma they feel will be associated with a diagnosis is not necessarily realised um, when that disclosure is made. The stigma at a community and society, at a societal level, is um, is more complicated and um, often I feel that we take a few steps forward, forward and then a step back. Um, but it's for me about advocacy, about positive stories that come publicly and to have um, trans, uh, young people and adults coming out and telling others uh, who they are um, and expressing the wonderful things they're doing and, and hopefully it will over time um, be accepted as we believe it is a, a normal expression of one's sense of self. Mm. That and I think you're spot on about uh, the importance of those groups that 
uh, where people can get together and, and talk about those experiences. I know in South Australia we have a number of parent-run groups, and I know they exist in other states. And I think it's amazing the, the work that can do to reduce stigma when children see other children, parents see other parents, and really understand, as everyone's been saying, all the panel members have been saying today, this is just a part of human variation. Uh, it may have been seemed exceptional to us you know, a decade or so ago, but we really know now it's not. And we know that, about, uh, that normalization is part of the key to combating stigma. Uh, so the next question, which I know a lot of people had, had written in questions about, uh, webinar participants had asked about, and I'm going to direct this one to Campbell, is does uh, dysphoria, gender dysphoria, always come with anxiety? Yeah, very good question too. Um, uh, I think the short answer from me is probably yes, but uh, it's a lot more complicated than that, I think. Um, if you're talking about uh, the young person's inner sense of uh, stress and uh, confusion, um, trying to work out who they are uh, and anxiety that might come with that, I think that's probably a, a universal thing. But for the kids whose families are attuned and receptive um, uh, and able to um, support them through that, I think the anxiety is not one that reaches sort of clinical um, uh, extent, if you like. Um, uh, we know from, and, and if we're able to provide over the course of development appropriate um, mental health and particularly um, medical care and treatment, um, uh, kids uh, develop uh, um, the same um, strength of emotional, social, cognitive development as the broader community. And uh, material from the Dutch study uh, from Amsterdam demonstrates that that uh, young children who um, uh, entered the program there um, met with uh, mental health clinicians, met with the endocrinologist, the paediatrician, moved through to have, um, when appropriate, pu um, puberty suppression and later um, uh, affirming um, uh, sex hormone treatment and maybe uh, surgical intervention later on. They have the same um, emotional um, uh, profile uh, of uh, the broader Dutch young persons community, although in addition they're actually performing better in terms of their participation in school and uh, work. Um, so we know that good support, good treatment um, makes the uh, likelihood of anxiety as a, as a clinical problem um, much, um, uh, much diminished. We know that if it's not there, parent support's not there, kids get really very stressed, lonely, isolated, um, and uh, frightened. Depression and self-harm, uh, suicidal ideations are uh, a common consequence in that circumstance. And I think it's amazing, like there's certain things I think as clinicians, other than providing hormone blockers, for example, that we sometimes can't really do anything in the face of in regards to anxiety around puberty. But I know from the work we all do that often some of the other anxieties around not being accepted or, or being stigmatized yeah. really do respond very positively to affirmation from us as clinicians and working yeah. with parents to be affirming as well. And, and, and also schools and broader social, yeah. uh, social uh, networks like with um, uh, um, families where religion is an important issue, um, to speak to the parish priest, um, to speak with uh, a nun. Um, uh, we've had a number of young kids who have come from Muslim backgrounds and uh, their parents have been positive and affirming, anxious about what the uh, doctrinal view would be. But um, if we, in, as uh, Elizabeth was saying, engage with uh, uh, the religious advisors for, for parents, um, in a respectful way, I think uh, we can go go a long way to helping that uh, anxiety for the family and, and then, then for the young person to diminish. Mm -hmm. But I do think that like young children in particular, I think, can struggle with things internally. And I know um, when uh, we've worked with uh, families and the kids and they've moved into uh, a, a social transition, uh, behavioural learning problems, um, uh, sometimes quite severe um, uh, mental health problems uh, seem to have uh, melted away 
in the face of the child being able to be who they want to be, be who they are at core. Um, and uh, parents often remark on that and we can see it ourselves um, uh, that there are many things we can do to diminish that anxiety. Mm, definitely. Um, the next question, actually, I mustn't have done my ordering very well. I'm also going to go to Campbell. Um, and this is one that I know a lot of people asked about and I just saw in the, the general chat earlier a lot of discussion going on around the co-occurrence of gender dysphoria and autism, spe autism spectrum disorders or developmental delays amongst young people. Yeah, um, we've certainly seen uh, uh, quite a number of kids with uh, uh, autism spectrum problems uh, in the clinic. Maybe up to a quarter. We're currently researching that, and it depends uh, where you um, uh, uh, draw the boundary around things such as uh, autism spectrum disorder, um, autism, etc. But it's it's something that is um, recognised universally in the, our clinic and others around the country and internationally as well to be a, a significantly increased co-occurrence. What it means, we don't know yet. Um, uh, some people say, oh, well, autistic kids, you know, they get a, a fix on something, you know, they're interested in bus timetables. Well, maybe it's just the same thing, they're interested in gender, but I don't believe that's the case from our clinical work with the kids we see. I think they experience the same level of intensity, persistence, strong identity statements that are, go beyond um, just a, a narrow um, interest. Of course, there might be some kids with autism where that's the case. They, you know, they uh, become obsessed with a particular character or personality. But the, the young people we see um, uh, in our context have very similar, the same sort of um, pervasive uh, uh, and intense internal uh, core sense of being of the other gender. And we've certainly seen that with young people with intellectual disability as well. Although interestingly, some of the kids, when they've been able to talk about that, um, to share with uh, their parents and with others, transition and maybe start medical treatment, uh, their cognitive uh, um, impairment seems to be um, uh, much uh, diminished and they, they get involved in school, they're learning, it looks like their um, uh, intellectual um, uh, difficulties uh, are um, uh, resolve, resolving to some degree. So um, the fact that one might have a, uh, a, a, an autistic, if you like, perspective on the world doesn't mean uh, that uh, gender dysphoria can also be part of your experience and it's our job to support these young kids uh, as well as others. And, and also incidentally, the, we were at a, a meeting recently where the um, Georgie Stein and her mum uh, were talking to a, a public forum. The first question was from a young um, gender diverse person who said, um, why can't we get the same support? Um, and I think that's a, um, a very um, important uh, question that um, uh, um, there's a significant number of the young kids we see who mightn't uh, fit into a more stereotypic male, stereotypic female, but are really exploring some uh, gender and we need to provide the same level of mental health and uh, as appropriate medical intervention for, for gender diverse young kids. Often they are ones where there might be a feeling of uh, some sort of uh, autistic uh, dimension as well, um, but uh, uh, they each deserve the same uh, level of uh, assessment, support and, and treatment. Thank you very much for those insights, Campbell. Um, I'm going to turn to Darren now uh, and ask a question of him. Um, and this is a difficult question because there's an amazing turnout of people on the webinar tonight and an amazing number of people registered. So it seems like so much interest in this area and, and understanding more about working with uh, children experiencing gender dysphoria. But we also know some clinicians may not feel that they know enough or may feel uncomfortable. And so what do you think, Darren, about the idea if a clinician is uh, feeling uncomfortable or feel like they lack knowledge, and perhaps particularly in a regional or remote area, do you think they should be referring on or do you think there's another pathway they might take? Thanks, Damien. That's, uh, that's a very difficult uh, question 
to answer, I think, one of the, one of the more difficult ones. Um, it, it has to do with autonomy for the clinician, um, as, as, along with the welfare of the child and the family. And this is a balancing act. Most clinicians will not have, um, I suppose, personal qualms about working with, with kids like this. But they may feel they lack the skills to do so. If they've never met transgender kids or adults before, they may really feel very inadequate when they're faced with this. Um, and you've heard from some amazing experts tonight um, who have a lot of knowledge that if you're working by yourself as a practitioner and you referred one of these kids, it's hard to know where to start. And so the immediate um, knee-jerk reaction is probably to say, I don't feel comfortable here. There's a problem. Uh, I don't think I know what to do. I'll refer them on. And I think that is not the best thing to do. Um, although it is a somewhat specialist field, if you're used to working with children or adolescents or families, then the issues that are raised are often a lot of common sense stuff uh, and a lot of things that you really can work with from your basic principles. It's also worth thinking about asking an expert. There are experts around the country who will gladly give their time um, to talk with you. Uh, I do Skype sessions occasionally with, uh, with um, transgender individuals around the country, and I help out families uh, uh, and, uh, and others by distance. Um, and I'm certainly happy to work with clinicians, and I'm, I'm sure most of the panel here would in some way or other want to help too. The more difficult issue is if one does, does have a religious or uh, some moral um, concern about, about transgenderism and, and working with kids who are transitioning. And that's a more difficult thing. My personal view, a bit confrontational, a bit controversial, is that if you're in a public system, you don't get that choice. You work with whoever comes in. But as a private practitioner, you do have some control over who you see. But uh, as the question states, it's far better to try and refer that person on to make sure they you don't abandon them until they get good, good quality care. Mm. And I think that's such an important point, and I always say this to students when I'm teaching about transgender issues, is that yes, you need to be knowledgeable, and if you have a referral and you don't really feel like you know enough, you've got one appointment between one and the next to go off and learn some more contact someone, ask for some supervision. But also, as you said, Darren, a lot of it is about if you have skills for working with children, a lot of it is working with a child. Yeah. And the same as working with any child. You need to have the knowledge, obviously, around gender dysphoria. But a lot of the time, I'm talking to children stuff that isn't specifically about gender. It's just about being themselves and, and coming into their being. So as I think you said, you know, basic skills can get you a long way. And then you have time in between sessions to, to bone up on some extra knowledge and touch base with other people. So I, I definitely agree with you that in most cases, and certainly in public systems, referring on is probably not the best response. Um, I'm going to go back and ask another perhaps double barrel question of Michelle, which as a researcher I shouldn't ask double barrel questions, but I think these two sort of fit together neatly. Um, is to sort of think about we know that, and you're one of the strong advocates for this, getting uh, hormones out of the court system, but at the moment they're still in the court system. So we have this lag time between blockers, which start you know, at a particular tanner stage of puberty progression, and then at the moment, not until 18, for getting hormones. So how do we support young people through that time, which is often the time when they're, they're most vulnerable? And also the double barrel part is how do we, how do we support their families to often um, you know, work with children who are, or adolescents who are feeling suicidal, who may be self-mutilating? Yes, thanks Damien. Um, it's a good question. There are, for the GPs in the audience, there are a number of things that we can do medically um, that can be extremely helpful. So for example, for the trans males who are post-pubertal who have completed their breast development, so usually that's anyone who started menstruating. One of the um, most successful interventions is to actually suppress their periods. Um, and we use uh, Primalort, which is a progestogen pill that can successfully um, induce amenorrhea or stop one's periods 
and he finds that uh, much of the dysphoria around menstruation ceases at that time. And there are a number of people, um, our team included, who feel that using Primalort is just as effective at this age as using uh, the injectable puberty blockers because you can't undo the breast development that's already there from the puberty blockers. So there are things medically and certainly um, we have information sheets for GPs that we can send out um, and psychologists will also often refer uh, the, the adolescent to the GP to, for that simple prescription which is cheap and easy to use and safe as well, I have that. Um, psychologically, um, acknowledging how distressing it is and how unfair with these arbitrary laws that we have that have been created over time by case law. I think listening to that distress Helping to um, the young person to, to understand that we that we understand that we hear them, um, and providing the support through the, um, the men, my mental health colleagues certainly play a, a huge role in, in helping the situation. Um, and for families too, um, there's a lot of um, the, the, the questions, Damien, about um, how do we help the parents. Um, there is a lot of information there out there about if one does want to access the court, how you might go about that. Um, in most states now, um, certainly families are given access to pro bono legal assistance and can be assisted through that process. It does take six to eight months, a pathologising, distressing, horrible process, um, but for some families it's, it's worth pursuing that. For others, we provide a Psychological scaffold, I think, is probably the best way um, to help hold um, the anxiety until one can start the day thing. Um, sometimes what we do is um, give the young person some certainty by booking an appointment on their 18th birthday. So for many 17-year-olds I see who have finished the assessment and who are due to start, we, we do the birthday appointment and give them something to look forward to and an end point where they can get on and start their lives um, in the body that they, um, that they feel um, is, is more right for them. So a few, a few tips there. I hope I've answered your question, Damien. You have. I think what you, I love what you said about being honest with young people around this is a system that we don't agree with. This is a system we wouldn't have agreed to. And sometimes acknowledging that doesn't mean we're not still sometimes complicit with it, but acknowledging that I think sometimes can be really powerful to hear from from us as cl clinicians that we agree this is not okay. Yeah, yeah, and I do I do think it helps uh, people know that we are fighting to change the system. Yeah, yeah. Now we only have just a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to just ask one last question and direct this to Elizabeth, and I think this is one that again has been coming up in the general chat. Um, how do so a young person uh, is aware of their gender, they know, they've maybe found a way to speak to you um, and they're struggling to think about how they might tell their parents, how they might tell their friends or their extended family members. So what are some of the ways you might assist them to do that disclosing? Okay, so I think the first part of that is helping them to actually define themselves and find their own words around it. Sometimes they don't actually have the language to talk about how they really feel. So firstly checking that they do have that and that they do understand that concept of themselves. Look, sometimes young people are in my room. I've had young people who have their parents sitting outside but they actually haven't told them what they're here for. Mm -hmm. and, and trying to facilitate that process for them and helping them find the words and, and helping them know that I'm going to support them when their parents come in and can they tell them there and then. I think it's probably unfair to the parents to be put on the spot like that but if that's the only safe place for a young person to feel comfortable about speaking up then I think that's the way that it's going to work best for them and just to make the parents realise that they can have support too if they need that. One of the things I did a couple of years ago was invite all the parents I was seeing into my backyard so they could, they could meet each other. And that network now has many, many parents in it and they arrange get-togethers and they do all sorts of things with the kids. 
So it's important that they have that peer support from other parents as well. Mm. You know, I find out what, what is the young person's concern about telling their parents, you know, and work with them through their worst fears. What's the worst thing that could happen and how realistic is this so that they're prepared for that worst case scenario and of course usually that's just not the case. You know, I want, to, I want them also to know what is it that they actually want their parents to know and what is it that they want their parents to do so they have a really clear idea of um, any requests that they might have from their parents. So I'll help them with aspects that they've mentioned to me that might help their parents understand the situation. So I think there's quite a lot we can do for that. And it, and it can take a few sessions to kind of get them to a point where they're ready to, to broach that subject. Hmm. Well, I think that was a really good question to end on because I think it really highlights what we've all been saying all throughout this evening, which is <coughs> young people who experience gender dysphoria are a diverse group. There's no one narrative. So we have young people who have all the words and all the language and they have it all in place and they have supportive parents who understand and who are aware. And we have young people who don't know all the language, who haven't seen Caitlyn Jenner, who are not aware of Chas Bono's journey, who have not told their parents. And this is what is coming to us in the clinical space is a, a whole range of diversity that then we respond to in the ways that Michelle and Elizabeth and Campbell and Darren have outlined this evening. So hopefully that's given everyone online tonight a little bit of a taste of, of some of the work that we're doing and hopefully that reflects the other work that's being done across the country in terms of supporting young people. Um, obviously there's a lot more to learn and we all keep these conversations going hopefully into the future. But I think it really is about acknowledging that diversity and acknowledging that the affirming approach is the way that we go because we know that contributes to positive outcomes. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I'd like to remind you all when we finish in a minute or two that you take a moment to fill out the exit survey. We want to know what you like. We want to know what you, ch what you struggled with. I know that you're going to say struggle with sound at times. Um, but other things that you would have liked us to have covered or, or aspects of the webinar that you'd like to see done in maybe different ways into the future. Um, I would really encourage you to continue to attend the webinars that the Mental Health Professionals Network runs. Hopefully as you've experienced tonight, they're a really useful way to bring together lots of different perspectives. We're five clinicians with similar viewpoints because I think we have very similar affirming approaches but different takes on different points and I think that's really important to acknowledge as well. There's one, I guess, unified response, which is the affirming response. There's lots of nuances in how we take up that affirming response. And that's really important to acknowledge as well. Um, I'd encourage you to, if you haven't already noticed, that there's a, another webinar coming up next week, which is on understanding first episode psychosis. So if you're interested in, in that, please do register for that. And also, please do consider setting up your own special interest networks as part of the um, MHPN or join ones that exist. I know that most states in Australia already have uh, networks around lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex issues. So becoming a part of that is another way to continue these conversations and to continue to have those peer support and informal ways of discussing issues that you're struggling with in your own work. Uh, so in closing, I'd really like to acknowledge the consumers and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you to our four wonderful speakers for, for their time, for all the fantastic insights they've given us this evening. Thank you to the technical team, to Julie and Jeff at MHPN for all of their wonderful work in making this happen, for bringing us together as a group. And thank you to all of the people who are online this evening. We've ended up, we started off with under 400. We've ended up with over 500 people online tonight. There's more than 1,000 more people who will watch us at a later date. So thank you all for your interest in this area and all the best in your work into the future. Good night.